Thank you for tuning into this session, Managing Recurrence. We'd like to thank our sponsor, OncoQuest Pharmaceuticals Incorporated, for making this session possible. Recurrence is something that's on the mind of every patient diagnosed with ovarian cancer. In this session, Dr. Sarah Adams will discuss the diagnosis and management of recurrent ovarian cancer. Dr. Sarah Adams is professor in the Division of Gynecologic Oncology at the University of New Mexico Comprehensive Cancer Center. Thank you for being here, Dr. Adams. I'll turn it over to you now. Good morning, I'm Sarah Adams. I'm going to be presenting about recurrent ovarian cancer. I'm a GYN oncologist at the University of New Mexico, so you'll see some pictures of New Mexico scattered through the slides. It's a beautiful place and I encourage everyone to visit. I'd just like to acknowledge that this can be a difficult topic to talk about. Um, and I hope that by providing additional information about how recurrent disease is diagnosed and especially how it's managed and how many options there are for treatment, um, that this will be reassuring for people or at least provide information that's helpful. I think there'll be a chance for me to answer questions at the end and I'm happy to do that. As far as disclosures go, I um, serve as a scientific advisor for the Ovarian Cancer Research Alliance and I have some research funding from AstraZeneca for a clinical trial as well as research funding for my lab from other foundations and organizations listed here. The outline for the talk today includes some information about the likelihood that ovarian cancer might recur after diagnosis a description of some of the symptoms that might commonly be experienced by people who have recurrent disease and the strategies that we use to diagnose recurrence. And then we'll talk in more detail about what kinds of treatment options are considered for recurrent ovarian cancer. And we'll talk briefly about clinical trials as a potential option for um, people who might have recurrent ovarian cancer and what enrolling in a clinical trial might entail and what kinds of questions you might wanna consider asking if you're thinking about something like this. Before we get started, I'd just like to point out that um, there are uh, three broad types of ovarian cancer and the most common type arises from the cells that line the ovary. That's called epithelial ovarian cancer. And since that's so much more common than the other types, most of the information I'll be providing is from clinical trials that predominantly include people with epithelial cancer. Germ cell cancers and stromal cancers are much more rare. Um, and are often treated in a similar fashion to epithelial cancers, but there's just less information about them because they are so rare. In addition, the most common kind of epithelial cancer is serous cancer. And again, those cancers are overrepresented in trials because they're so much more common in people with this disease. Um, and there are some now more, um, more specific targeted therapies for clear cell cancers or different strategies for treating mucinous cancers. And we can talk about those a little bit also, but you'll see that the, um, the majority of the information that's provided is about serous ovarian cancer and usually high-grade serous ovarian cancer. Just to start with the basics, um, it, when someone is diagnosed with ovarian cancer, our initial goal is curative. Uh, we treat people with curative intent, um, and that often entails very aggressive treatment combining surgery with chemotherapy. Uh, there are two approaches to this. Sometimes people have chemotherapy before surgery, and that's called neoadjuvant chemotherapy. And sometimes people have surgery first followed by chemotherapy, and that's called primary debulking surgery or primary cytoreductive surgery followed by adjuvant treatment. The decision about whether to have surgery in the middle of chemotherapy or up front has a lot to do with the distribution of disease and a person's um, other medical conditions. And it's usually a... Um, a judgment about how safe the surgery might be and whether a person might benefit from delaying surgery and trying to shrink the tumor further using chemotherapy to reduce the, the um, aggressiveness or the extent of surgery that's required to remove all of the disease. The goal of these surgeries is always to remove as much disease as possible because we know that removing all of the visible disease during a cytoreductive surgery results in better outcomes for patients. And since this is something that we feel like we have uh, control over, where we don't have control over someone's age or other prognostic features, um, it's really important to make sure that we set people up for the best outcomes at the time of surgery. Oftentimes after initial treatment with either neoadjuvant or adjuvant chemotherapy, people might receive additional treatment called maintenance therapy, which is intended to uh, suppress tumor growth or extend the amount of time before they might need um, chemotherapy again. So extend the, the disease-free interval or the time between treatments. 
And the two types of maintenance therapy that's used currently for ovarian cancer are bevacizumab, which is also called Avastin. This is an anti-angiogenic drug. Or a PARP inhibitor, which is an oral agent that's been introduced more recently uh, in the treatment of ovarian cancer with spectacular outcomes. And sometimes people are now treated with both of these agents concurrently as dual maintenance therapy. We hope that people will be without evidence of disease forever, or at least for as long as possible. But at some point, they often are requiring treatment for recurrent disease. And to try to give them the best outcomes in the treatment of recurrent disease, we'd like to uh, perform cancer surveillance to, um, to monitor people for possible symptoms of recurrence so that we can catch it early uh, and provide uh, the greatest number of treatment options for an individual. And so typically people undergo cancer surveillance, which includes clinic visits usually every three months for the first couple of years. And sometimes that gets spaced out to four months and then six months. And as you get farther from diagnosis, it might get spaced out even further to annual surveillance visits. And the goals of these visits are to assess for any symptoms that might be suggestive of cancer recurrence and to perform a physical exam, including a pelvic exam, to evaluate for any signs of, of possible cancer recurrence. And also, of course, to check in with people and to manage any residual um, treatment-related toxicities or side effects associated with prior treatment and to optimize their quality of life. So now that we've talked about overall treatment, we'll talk briefly about what are the chances that ovarian cancer will recur after initial treatment. And this is the harder part of the talk because it turns out that most people with ovarian cancer do experience cancer recurrence. Um, and the chances that the cancer will recur are higher in people who are diagnosed initially with advanced stage disease. And so probably most people know that the majority of people with ovarian cancer are diagnosed with metastatic disease at the time of diagnosis. It's characteristic of this cancer and very typical of what we see clinically. And so since most people have stage three or four disease at diagnosis, you can see that the majority of those people do experience cancer recurrence um, with you know, 75 to 80% of people with stage three disease and 90% or more of people with stage four disease having recurrence at some point. You can also see that even people diagnosed with early stage disease sometimes experience cancer recurrence. And what's important to know about this is, is that the time to recurrence varies widely, uh, even within people who initially had advanced stage disease. And so someone with stage four disease might go a year or more without disease recurrence, or she might have recurrence within a couple of months. And that's also true of the other stages. And so really the goals of treatment are to eliminate the cancer and um, also to extend the time between treatments, extend someone's recurrent fr recurrence free interval. And so when we see people in the clinic and we're evaluating for signs of recurrence, what kinds of strategies do we use to diagnose uh, cancer recurrence? And what kinds of things might a person watch for herself to um, identify concerns that might be associated with cancer recurrence? People might be familiar with this, um, this description of ovarian cancer as being silent or whispering and having subtle symptoms. And sometimes this can be frustrating for people because the symptoms that are associated with ovarian cancer can also be associated with lots of other conditions, including benign conditions like indigestion, um, or edema for other reasons, you know, long car trips, things like that. And this is true also with recurrent disease because recurrent disease like primary ovarian cancer tends to occur in the peritoneal cavity, uh, the abdominal cavity, and tends to cause similar symptoms in some people, including bloating or abdominal fullness, which might be associated with disease on the bowel or with ascites accumulation. Some people have pelvic pain, we often ask about changes in bowel or bladder habits to suss out uh, effects on those organs. Early satiety or feeling full quickly or not having much of an appetite um, might be associated with pressure on the stomach or with ascites accumulation. Some people have vaginal discharge or bleeding if they have recurrence in the pelvis. That's not as common with ovarian cancer, but it would definitely be something to report to your provider. Pain with intercourse uh, or pain in the pelvis for other, at other times. Um, lymphedema or swelling in your legs, uh, especially if you experience swelling in one leg and not the other, that would definitely be something to report to a provider. 
uh, shortness of breath, difficulty breathing, or nausea or vomiting, all of these symptoms are things that would be um, concerning if they persisted and didn't have another cause associated with them. And so we usually tell our patients to please let us know if they have persistent symptoms or if they have questions about them to at least call us and we can talk over the phone about whether it's something to follow up on with an earlier exam or possibly imaging studies. Once someone has symptoms or when she's coming in for a surveillance visit, we use several different strategies to assess for recurrent disease. Um, primarily, we perform a physical exam on people every time they come in for their surveillance visit. And what we're looking for are any signs of cancer recurrence that might be evident on physical exam, such as pulmonary findings associated with pleural uh, effusions or pleural fluid buildup, um, abdominal distension or evidence of fluid in the abdomen associated with ascites, tenderness or pain, and we typically do a pelvic exam because that gives us a, an opportunity to assess someone's pelvis for any nodularity or strictures, things that we can sometimes feel on pelvic exam that might not be apparent on an abdominal exam. Uh, we assess for leg swelling also because sometimes disease in the pelvis can cause swelling in the legs or people might have blood clots associated with cancer recurrence that can manifest that way. It's Difficult though, because with intra-abdominal disease recurrence, it's not uncommon for someone to have a normal physical exam just because we can't assess some of those locations easily with typical exam maneuvers. And so we also watch tumor markers, uh, typically CA125, which is a protein that's produced uh, in people with ovarian cancer, usually at higher levels than in people without ovarian cancer. And while this tumor marker has not been as helpful as a screening test for ovarian cancer it is fairly helpful in people who have a confirmed diagnosis of ovarian cancer as a way of monitoring for possible disease recurrence. What that means is if someone has a high CA125 value at the time of diagnosis and the CA125 levels go down with treatment and then we start to see them come up again, we might be concerned that that was associated with cancer recurrence and we would get follow-up imaging studies to assess for disease um, in the abdomen, pelvis, or chest. It's, it can be challenging because CA125 levels can, can fluctuate um, and they might rise and fall and rise and fall. But usually if they double, um, even if they're still within the normal range for a particular laboratory test, it attracts our attention and makes us concerned about cancer recurrence. Because we've seen that even uh, low levels of CA125 that are higher than a person's typical baseline can be associated with cancer recurrence. And so we would usually follow up on a rise in CA125 with imaging studies to look for evidence of disease um, that wasn't diagnosed on physical exam or might not be symptomatic yet. For people with ovarian cancer, we typically use CT scans to assess for disease recurrence. In some cases, we might use an MRI scan depending on the situation and the particular person. The sensitivity for CT scans is pretty good, um, and we're usually able to see changes in the size of tumors or the emergence of new tumors in the peritoneal cavity. Sometimes people might get a PET scan, which is an imaging modality that allows us to look for increased metabolic activity that can be associated with, with tumors. Um, by injecting a, a, a tagged sugar formulation, that can be taken up by tumor cells more readily than by normal cells. And sometimes if there's concern about whether an imaging finding is actually disease recurrence, people might undergo a directed biopsy to confirm that what they're seeing on imaging is actually uh, a recurrence of their ovarian cancer. And so once a recurrence is diagnosed, we'll talk through some of the treatment options that are available to people and some of the advantages and disadvantages of each of them and strategies for deciding among them, which can sometimes be difficult as well. As I mentioned, the goal up front in treating ovarian cancer is curative. We subject people to very aggressive treatment because we hope we'll be able to get rid of the cancer for good. But as I've shown you, a majority of people eventually do experience cancer recurrence. And so the treatment goals of uh, managing recurrent disease are important to review um, as you're thinking about treatment options. And so, Classically, it was considered that recurrent ovarian disease, ovarian cancer was not curative, that it was unlikely, unlikely to go away permanently. And so the treatment goals were focused um, primarily on extending someone's 
uh, quality of life and her duration of survival um, and optimizing her symptom control during treatment. I would say more recently, the options for treating recurrent disease have become better. And so we're seeing better outcomes in people with recurrent disease uh, with more treatment options available to them. And so the, the treatment strategies have started to mimic frontline disease with dual therapy and in some cases even triple therapy uh, with the idea that this aggressive approach yields dividends in um, extending someone's treatment-free intervals and extending her overall survival as well as her quality of life. In general, options for treating recurrent ovarian cancer include surgery, chemotherapy, targeted therapeutics, immune therapy, in some cases, primarily in the context of clinical trials, hormonal therapy, radiation therapy, and participation in clinical trials, and also something called best supportive care, which is a focus on symptom management without tumor-directed therapy. And these are basically the entire range of cancer treatments um, that are available to people with ovarian cancer and with other tumor types. So I've told you that surgery is a, um, is a key component of frontline treatment for ovarian cancer uh, and really characterizes um, ovarian cancer treatment uh, as a primary modality uh, for addressing even metastatic disease. In the recurrent setting, surgery is much less likely to be considered. And the reason for this is that the benefit of surgery in the recurrent setting is not as clear as it is in the frontline setting. There are some exceptions, however. In someone who has, for example, a bowel obstruction, surgery may be offered to palliate the bowel obstruction, to manage the symptoms of the bowel obstruction by resecting tumor that's impinging on the bowel. So with that directed goal, surgery can be very helpful uh, to relieve an obstruction and allow someone to regain bowel function um, and to then uh, qualify for additional treatment with chemotherapy or some other modality. Sometimes people are offered what's called secondary debulking, which means uh, operating on them to remove all visible disease. And uh, the integration of secondary debulking into someone's treatment varies based on her experience with prior treatment, her expected prognosis, and the distribution of disease at the time of recurrence. In general, uh, secondary debulking is primarily restricted to people who have what's called platinum sensitive disease which means that it's been a long time since the last chemotherapeutic regimen was completed, indicating that the tumor overall has a favorable prognosis um, and that the benefit of surgery is likely to be uh, more durable. Um, it's also more commonly offered to people who have limited sites of recurrence because that requires less aggressive treatment, less radical surgery to completely resect disease and limits the risks associated with surgery um, and is associated with longer benefit from surgery. As I mentioned, long treatment-free intervals, which usually goes along with platinum sensitivity and limited sites of occurrence. Uh, typically, surgery is not offered if someone has widespread metastatic ascites uh, because that's associated with poorer outcomes associated with interval debulkings. And, and people who are offered surgery typically have what's called good performance status, which means their overall health is good and they're expected to tolerate surgery well. As with upfront surgery, the best outcomes are seen in patients who can be optimally debulked, which means all of the visible tumor is successfully removed at the time of surgery. And since recurrent disease is usually diagnosed with smaller volume disease, minimally invasive surgery options may be available, such as robotic surgery or laparoscopic surgery to limit the morbidity of the surgery and the time in the hospital and um, to allow someone to have a speedier recovery after resection. The primary modality for treating recurrent ovarian cancer, though, is chemotherapy. Um, and this is because ovarian cancer most often recurs at multiple sites, typically scattered through the abdominal cavity, sometimes in the lungs, sometimes other sites. And so having a treatment strategy that addresses all sites in the body is very helpful. And chemotherapy does that. It is administered systemically, so it circulates through the body and, and can be um, effective at multiple sites of disease. In general, the response to what we call second line chemotherapy, which means chemotherapy for recurrent disease, is um, can be predicted based on the tumor type and the size and the extent of disease at the time of recurrence, but primarily by a person's response to previous chemotherapy. And so this is the concept of platinum sensitivity. 
and it's defined by the amount of time since someone received platinum-based therapy um, until a cancer recurrence. So if someone has a treatment-free interval that's less than six months, meaning they recur within six months of prior platinum-based chemotherapy, their disease is considered platinum resistant. Whereas if they have a treatment-free interval longer than that, their disease uh, is considered platinum sensitive and they're likely to be offered platinum-based chemotherapy again, since it worked so well the first time. You can see that as the treatment-free interval ex extends even farther, greater than 12 months, the response rate increases. So the longer it's been since someone previously had chemotherapy, the more likely they are to, to respond to chemotherapy the second time or the third time. And so here are these definitions of platinum sensitivity and platinum resistance based on recurrence within six months or beyond six months of prior treatment. And then the third category is called platinum refractory disease, which is the situation where the disease progresses or grows while someone's receiving chemotherapy. And in those cases, we feel that platinum-based chemotherapy is unlikely to be helpful again, and people um, generally are offered other types of chemotherapeutic regimens. Here are some examples, and this is, this is old data now, but these are some classic clinical trials in people with platinum-sensitive uh, recurrent disease. And you can see that the response rates uh, vary, but have increased over time with the more recent trials showing response rates um, approaching 80% with combinations of carboplatin, which is the most commonly used platinum-based chemotherapy, and other chemotherapy drugs, Taxol or Doxol or gemcitabine. And you can see that with more recent trials, Avastin, the anti-angiogenic drug that we spoke about earlier, may also be combined with chemotherapy to again extend the treatment-free interval, interval and improve the response to recurrent um, disease treatment. Uh, and that's shown here with increasing progression-free survival over time with these improvements in chemotherapeutic regimens. And this has continued to improve with more recent um, approved regimens for recurrent disease. In platinum-resistant disease, we typically don't use platinum-based agents, again, and some of the non-platinum chemotherapies are shown here on the left, doxol, topotecan, taxotere, taxol, evastin. And so sometimes these are used as a single-agent therapy, and sometimes they're used in combination, most commonly in combination with avastin. Um, in people who uh, recurred um, more quickly after their previous platinum-based chemotherapy regimen. And you can see listed on the right side some of the more common side effects associated with these, disease, these treatments. And these side effects are also um, a significant consideration in deciding which one of these agents to use. For example, if someone experienced neuropathy when she previously had chemotherapy with probably a platinum-based agent like carboplatin, and Taxol, then we might not choose Taxol again because the risk that she would experience that side effect again would be quite high. We might choose a different agent. And so both the likelihood of, of a person responding or of her tumor responding to treatment and the expected side effects weigh into the decisions about which chemotherapeutic regimen to consider and which combination to consider for people with recurrent disease. I mentioned targeted agents, and we've talked about some of them along the way. These are drugs that are specifically designed to uh, target a particular cell type, sometimes a tumor, but sometimes cells in a person's body that support the tumor. And so the advantages of these approaches to treatment in contrast to chemotherapy are that they are intended to have less of an effect on bystander cells. And so to say that a different way, Chemotherapy is designed to kill rapidly dividing cells of any type, which is why people often lose their hair when they're on chemotherapy, because the rapidly dividing cells that support hair growth are affected by the chemotherapy, just like tumor cells might be. Whereas targeted cells may specifically attack tumor cells and not have as much of an effect on healthy cells, or bystander cells. And this is a really appealing approach to cancer therapy because we hope that it'll limit the side effects that people have and direct treatment where where we need it at the tumor site. Um, a better understanding of the mechanism of action is also very helpful when we're combining agents to make sure that we take uh, complementary approaches with the combination of different uh, treatment types to get the most advantage for a person in um, the efficacy of their treatment. And so one example of a, of a targeted agent is bevacizumab, 
avacin. This is an antibody that's designed to specifically block a protein expressed on healthy cells that drives blood vessel growth. And the goal of this drug is to prevent blood vessel growth into the tumor, which limits the tumor's ability to get oxygen and glucose that it needs to grow. And so instead of directly targeting the cancer, this is an example of a drug that um, prevents a person's body from supporting cancer growth. And since it works in a very different way than chemotherapy, this allows us to combine it with chemotherapy and also is probably responsible for the fact that most people tolerate avastin treatment very well with limited side effects. PARP inhibitors are another example of a targeted therapy. In this case, they are specifically targeting tumor cells, um, but they are designed to be lethal in tumor cells that have a, a defect in DNA repair. And the best example of that is tumor cells associated with the BRCA1, BRCA1, or BRCA2 gene mutation. And these might be inherited gene mutations, or they might be mutations that a tumor acquires. But when the tumor has a defect in their ability to repair DNA breaks, specifically double-stranded DNA breaks, the PARP inhibitors block alternative pathways for DNA repair and are specifically lethal in the tumor cells while sparing normal cells that have intact uh, double-stranded DNA repair proteins. Because of this mechanism, the best response to PARP inhibitors has been seen in people who have um, inherited or acquired BRCA gene mutations with very high response rates, used as maintenance therapy and um, evaluated in the therapeutic setting. And here's a, just a, an illustration of one of the trials, and there are many, testing the effects of PARP inhibitors, in this case as maintenance therapy, which as we discussed earlier means that a person receives frontline chemotherapy, usually with a platinum agent in combination often with Taxol, maybe also with Avastin. And when she finishes the cytotoxic, the chemotherapy treatment, she will start treatment with the PARP inhibitor, which is a pill that she takes daily. And in this trial and in many others, it was demonstrated that continuing treatment with the PARP inhibitor after chemotherapy significantly extended the amount of time before recurrence was diagnosed. And that this benefit was seen even more um, profoundly in people who had BRCA gene mutations. But there was also benefit seen in people who did not have a BRCA gene mutation. And this has um, shown us that these new treatments for ovarian cancer may be valuable in a broader population of people with recurrent disease or in the frontline setting to prevent cancer recurrence for as long as possible. I mentioned earlier that immune therapy is currently only available for people with ovarian cancer in the context of a clinical trial, but there is a lot of interest in integrating immune therapy into treatment for ovarian cancer, and so there are several clinical trials underway that are testing immune therapy agents. And so I thought I would describe this just briefly since it's such a different approach to cancer treatment. We talked about how targeted therapy is different than chemotherapy based on the specificity of the drugs and their ability to specifically attack a, a cell type. Immune therapy is different because instead of targeting the tumor cells, it targets a person's immune cells and improves their ability to recognize and the, the immune cells ability to recognize and kill cancer cells. And so the goals of immune therapy are to elicit an immune response to the cancer or amplify an immune response that a person might already have developed. And ideally to induce something called immune memory, which is a protective response, kind of like what happens after you get a vaccine that your body is then protected against um, infection with a particular agent like chickenpox. In this case, we're hoping that teaching the immune system to recognize cancer um, will allow a person's body to reject the cancer um, and also to prevent it from coming back. And some examples of immune therapy include cancer vaccines with, which have been developed and tested in ovarian cancer, T cell therapy, T cells are white blood cells that can kill tumor cells. Um, and T cell therapy is a strategy to increase the number of T cells that are available for a person. And these immune checkpoint antibodies, which are new drugs that have been um, that have been developed in other tumor types that have been very successful in treating melanoma and lung cancer and some other solid tumors that are designed to unleash the power of the immune system, basically uh, to remove some of the uh, hurdles to immune recognition of tumor cells. 
um, by blocking inhibitory pathways. And so, uh, you know, this is a diagram of an immune response that I show to students sometimes, and it just helps me to understand the goals of the different types of treatment. And so I show it just to explain what, what's happening with different immune therapy regimens. And so this is a very simplified version of how an immune response happens. Um, an anti antigen presenting cell, which is the star-shaped cell on the left, um, picks up antigen or dead tumor cells or uh, floating pieces of tumor uh, cell membrane, and it presents those antigens to T cells, which are the effector arm, the, the business end of the immune system. Um, and they basically educate the T cells. They show them what the target is. Uh, they cause the T cells to proliferate, so there are more of them. And then we hope that the T cells will traffic to the tumor site and kill tumor cells. And so the analogy I like to use with students is like middle school. So the antigen presenting cells are the informers. They, they gather information and they alert the T cells to the problem, um, in this case, the tumor. And then the T cells are the, the effector end of the immune system. They go out and take care of the tumor. And I always say that I just don't, I can't bring myself to label that little kid a tumor, but you get the idea that the goal is to um, identify and eliminate the, the tumor cells in the body. And so the goals of immune therapy are to amplify this process. For example, tumor vaccines might specifically increase the information that's provided to antigen presenting cells. So they are better able to educate immune cells or T cells. And T cell therapies are designed to increase the number or the efficacy or the anti-tumor um, capacity of, of T cells, which are the cells that recognize and kill tumor cells. And so different immune therapy strategies are focused on different components of this uh, immune response. But the overall goal is the same, is to teach someone's immune system to recognize cancer cells and to eliminate them and to remember what they look like so they can recognize them if they start to come back. Uh, and that's outlined here. As I said, immune therapy has not yet been approved for ovarian cancer, except in specific situations where the tumor has um, proteins or markers that indicate that it might be a good target for immune therapy. Um, but this is one of the reasons why we test people's tumors for evidence of these markers and why we continue to modify immune therapy regimens to try to improve their efficacy in people with ovarian cancer. Um, uh, another option for the treatment of recurrent disease is hormonal therapy. Um, it's been demonstrated that many ovarian cancers express hormone receptors, estrogen receptors or progesterone receptors, and that presents an opportunity to treat the cancer with oral regimens, typically oral regimens, um, with estrogen receptor modifiers or with progesterone agents. And these can be um, helpful because these tend to be well-tolerated agents. As I mentioned, they're typically oral. Um, they don't have the same side effects as, um, as a cytotoxic chemotherapy infusion. And sometimes it, it can help to stabilize someone's disease and give her time to recover from her previous treatment before considering another type of therapy. And sometimes it can stabilize disease for months or, or longer, and that can be especially helpful for people um, to sustain their quality of life during treatment for recurrent disease. Finally, uh, radiation therapy is an option for ovarian cancer, but it's not used very commonly, primarily because ovarian cancer typically re recurs at multiple sites in the abdomen. And it's difficult to, um, to subject someone to radiation of many different locations of disease. And so radiation therapy is often reserved for people who might have one particular site of disease or one particular um, site that is symptomatic. And it's also used in situations where people might have intracranial or brain metastases or spinal metastases, um, where it can be particularly effective and where it can be directly targeted at the tumor site. And lastly, I, I bring this up because I try to remember to bring it up in every discussion with patients about treatment options, that there, there is always the possibility of postponing treatment for recurrent disease, or at least something to consider depending on a person's goals of care. And so while we generally think that identifying recurrence early and treating it early results in better outcomes, there was a clinical trial now done more than 10 years ago to ask the question whether early treatment of recurrence results in better outcomes or not. And there are a lot of caveats to this study, but I'll show you the results um, and then talk about how it's changed my practice and how it might um, influence decisions about treatment of recurrent disease. 
Uh, this was a study that was done in Europe in 2010, which is now a long time ago. And the question, as I said, that they were asking was whether early treatment improved overall survival. And so what they did was they randomized patients, participants in this trial, to know about their CA125 levels or to be blinded to their CA125 levels. So people underwent surveillance, just like we discussed, and had CA125 tumor biomarker levels evaluated. And if that level doubled, they were either assigned to be told that their CA125 level had doubled, or they were assigned to not know. And so that people who learned about the doubling of their CA125 was, were described as the early treatment group because they initiated treatment based on those CA125 levels, regardless of uh, what was found on CT scan or whether they had symptoms. And the other group of people were considered delayed treatment group uh, because they only initiated treatment for recurrent disease if they had symptoms or findings on uh, imaging studies that were usually done in response to symptoms. And as I mentioned, the goal of the trial was to evaluate um, overall survival, so long-term outcome of these people. Uh, and there were also assessments of their quality of life to determine whether delaying treatment improved someone's quality of life by giving her longer time off of some of these therapies and um, a time without the side effects associated with active treatment. And so shown here is the survival curve associated with this trial, which seemed kind of shocking when it came out um, because it showed that there was no difference in overall survival in these two groups. Um, and the quality of life assessments indicated that the people who started treatment earlier had diminished quality of life, primarily because they ended up having more rounds of chemotherapy during their lives. And those were associated with uh, toxicity and side effects. And so this doesn't mean that we shouldn't treat recurrent disease or that we shouldn't look for recurrent disease. But what it says to me is that sometimes it's important to consider whether a break from treatment is um, important for someone's quality of life. And the way I use these information in my practice are to talk to people who have, for example, small volume disease about close surveillance and, and um, potentially evaluating with a CT scan in two or three months just to see what the rate of growth is of the disease. And if it remains small and people are asymptomatic, maybe we can extend the time before we start treatment again. That's not appropriate for everyone. And it's not always the best choice for everyone, but I try to include it as one of the choices I talk about when I talk about chemotherapy or clinical trial participation um, or targeted therapeutics. Also on that spectrum, the possibility of close surveillance um, and uh, attention to symptom management. Finally, we'll talk a little bit about clinical trials because these are available at many cancer centers, at most cancer centers and they present additional opportunities for cancer treatment and additional options for people who might have recurrent disease. And so to define a clinical trial, just to, to distinguish it from standard treatment, a clinical trial is designed to test a hypothesis. It's an experiment, um, but it's not subjecting people to, um, you know, people aren't guinea pigs in this approach. They're very carefully designed to evaluate novel treatments in a way that is ethical and that maintains someone's access to treatment. And we'll talk about how that's done as we move through. But um, beyond general standard health care, the goal is to contribute to our understanding of, of treatment options and to introduce novel and hopefully improved uh, treatment opportunities for people with ovarian cancer and other tumor types. And so some of the advantages of participating in a clinical trial are the assurance that there's a lot of oversight of clinical trials, which includes both institutional review boards. So at the institutional level, there's a lot of oversight of clinical trial design and clinical trial conduct, as well as national oversight, particularly with clinical trials that are run through national consortia affiliated with the National Cancer Institute. Um, and one of these is called NRG and one is called the Gynecologic Oncology Group. But these are national organizations that run clinical trials for gynecologic cancers and other tumor types that have um, international experts uh, overseeing the design of trials, the conduct of trials, the evaluation of any side effects that occur during treatment on a trial, um, and very careful assessments of patient outcomes uh, to decide whether the introduction of a new treatment um, is beneficial and should be made available to people more broadly. It's very important to know that participation in a clinical trial is voluntary. It requires that someone sign informed consent. It should be not coercive. Everyone should be reassured that their cancer will be treated 
um, and they will be um, provided with care regardless of whether they decide to participate in a clinical trial or not. And it's important to understand that different clinical trials are designed differently depending on the, the stage of development of a new treatment and the goals of the trial. But some of the things that often come up in discussions of clinical trials are strategies to um, reduce bias. So to, to counter our um, normal human impulse to want to put someone in a particular treatment group or to want to think that one particular arm might be better than another or, or to um, select people with bias who might be interested in participating in a trial. And so to counteract that bias, many clinical trials are randomized. So people are assigned to a treatment group based on often a computer algorithm uh, so that we don't have control over the treatment group that they're assigned to and they don't have a choice either. Um, and that's to make sure that the two treatment groups are balanced with regards to uh, features that might impact treatment outcomes, someone's age, her stage, um, whether or not she has a BRCA mutation, things like that. Um, and sometimes trials are blinded because uh, in order to really assess whether there's a biological difference in outcomes based on one treatment or another, it's helpful if people don't know whether they're on the experimental treatment or not. Um, because sometimes people assume benefit is associated with a new treatment or may ascribe um, symptoms to a new treatment that might actually not be due to that treatment. And so sometimes neither the patient, the subject, nor the physician knows whether she's getting the, the new treatment or whether she's on a placebo. But I wanna say that uh, in general, cancer clinical trials do not have placebo arms where someone's not receiving any treatment. Typically they have a control arm, which is standard of care chemotherapy. And then the experimental arm is standard of care chemotherapy with the addition of a new agent. And so everybody is getting treatment. It's just that one group is receiving this additional agent uh, as well as the baseline standard of care. It would not be ethical to enroll people in a trial that randomized them to receive placebo only for their cancer. So there are different phases of clinical trials, and this is important to understand if you're considering enrolling in one so you know what the goals of the trial are and how it's designed and how that might affect your treatment. Phase one trials are typically first in human trials where new agents are being tested for the appropriateness of treatment in people. Um, and usually the goal is to ensure that these agents are safe to use in people. Um, these are typically smaller trials. They are typically not randomized and they don't usually have blinding associated with them. Um, and they might only treat three people at a particular dose level of a new drug. And if those people tolerate it, then maybe three more people are given a higher dose. And the goal is to establish a dose that can be tested more broadly for its uh, ability to um, impact treatment outcomes. The next phase of clinical trials is a phase two trial, which takes that new dose established in a phase one trial and tests it in a larger population of people with a disease of interest. And the goal here is to show that there's a treatment benefit using the new agent. And so depending on the size of the trial, these might be randomized or they might not be. It might be a smaller phase two trial. And they might or might not be blinded, again, depending on the particular question being asked and the goals of the trial. But this is a an opportunity to figure out whether the new treatment really works in the disease that you're targeting. And then phase three trials are the, the very large trials, often enrolling hundreds of people to test whether the new treatment is better than standard of care therapy. And so these are typically uh, very large trials that include a, a control group. And as I said earlier, the control group means getting standard of care treatment and the experimental group is often standard of care treatment plus this new agent. These are the trials that are often randomized and blinded, um, but in order for something to progress to a phase three trial, it must have already shown some evidence of efficacy in phase two. And so our expectation that this will be beneficial, beneficial to a person is different in the setting of a phase three trial than it might be in a phase one trial. And finally, there's something called a phase four trial, which is really post-marketing um, information that's gathered from consumers to identify potential toxicities that maybe didn't show up during the conduct of a clinical trial um, that only show up when you're treating many more people with a drug or a broader range of people uh, with a particular drug. And so I think there are a lot of benefits of clinical trial participation. Um, in addition to the oversight and the careful care that people get while they're on a clinical trial, this provides access to new agents that uh, have demonstrated promise in the treatment of 
of cancer and often specifically ovarian cancer. But it's important to know that, for example, with a phase one trial, there really isn't a lot of information about whether it will work in people with cancer yet. Um, it must have shown efficacy in, in animal cancer models and it must have shown safety in animal models. But this is really the first opportunity to find out whether it's tolerable in patients. But I think there are a lot of advantages to considering phase one trials, um, specifically that you may have access to the newest uh, types of cancer therapy that may be effective for your particular cancer, we just don't know yet. On the other end of the spectrum, phase three trials are the trials that are huge and rolling hundreds of people to determine whether the new regimen is better than what we've been using all along. And the benefits of enrolling in a phase tr three trial include that um, whatever drug is being tested, as I said, has already made it through phase one and phase two has demonstrated efficacy and has a strong enough signal, has, has sufficient evidence to justify a hugely um, expensive, um, usually national or multinational clinical trial that is expected to, to change the standard of care. And so sometimes people are less comfortable with the idea of randomization or the idea of blinding associated with a phase three trial and prefer smaller trials or um, are more comfortable with the idea of enrolling in a smaller trial. Sometimes people prefer knowing that a drug already has some safety data and some efficacy data before they consider participating in a trial. But those are the differences between the different trial types that you might consider when you're presented with options for clinical trials um, for the treatment of your disease. And so here's a list of questions that you might consider asking if you're considering participating in a clinical trial. You can ask what's the scientific rationale for the trial, you know, what's what evidence has been developed so far to indicate that this is a promising treatment for ovarian cancer? What are the goals of the trial? How many people will be enrolled? Um, what are the eligibility requirements? What are the possible risks or what are the expected side effects of this particular agent? What information is available about what to expect? Um, what are the endpoints? Who is the sponsor? And who can I contact to get more information about the trial? All of these things, any questions that people have are, are absolutely appropriate and are important to address if you're considering clinical trial participation. But I think that this really markedly expands our options for treatment um, and in some cases presents really valuable opportunities to get access to, to um, treatment modalities that aren't available outside of the context of a clinical trial. And so just briefly, some of the emerging therapeutics for the treatment of ovarian cancer that are currently being evaluated in clinical trials include something called an antibody drug conjugate, which is a very, uh, a very exciting targeted approach to treatment. In this case, it's using an antibody as a targeting agent, and they, the antibody is linked to a chemotherapy molecule, a chemotherapy moiety. And so the antibody specifically targets tumor cells and basically brings the chemotherapy directly to the tumor cell where it's converted into an active drug inside of the cell in those cases. And uh, several of these have shown a lot of promise in clinical trials in ovarian cancer recently, including in platinum resistant ovarian cancer. And so this is a, a type of treatment that has generated a lot of excitement and a lot of hope in our field and that is available currently in several clinical trials that people might consider. We talked a lot about immune therapy and there are several clinical trials testing immune therapies either alone or in combination with with chemotherapies or with targeted agents in ovarian cancer. Uh, trying to use um, chemotherapies or targeted agents like a PARP inhibitor to sensitize the tumor to immune therapy to improve the response to immune therapy in ovarian cancer. And basically to adapt these regimens to the um, particular characteristics of ovarian cancer to get the most benefit for people who have this disease. And as I mentioned, a lot of these are combination regimens um, linking chemotherapies with novel agents or chemotherapies with immune therapy taking these different approaches to treatment to maximize the benefit that we can um, achieve for someone to eradicate her cancer and to extend the amount of time that she goes without treatment. And so just to summarize, there are many options for the treatment of recurrent ovarian cancer and several important factors might influence a person's choice about what treatment is appropriate for her, including her experience with prior chemotherapy, what kinds of toxicity she might've experienced on prior regimens, how long it's been since she completed chemotherapy, what the distribution of disease is, um, and what her goals of care are. And these are all things to discuss with your healthcare provider. And certainly there's lots of information on clinical trials, including on the Ovarian Cancer Research Alliance website. And I think I'll have a chance to answer questions live after this talk, um, and I'm happy to address any questions that people might have. 
Thank you so much. I appreciate the opportunity and I look forward to hearing from everyone.